This is the first of two airway lectures that we'll, that we'll have. The second one will be for, uh, by uh, Terry Coulter, who is the uh, head of the ICUs, all of the ICUs here, and our kind of main pulmonologist. I'm going to run through the basic stuff. Okay, we're going to go over anatomy and physiology, mechanisms of ventilation, which is actually pretty important and often not fully understood. Principles of oxygenation, what makes you breathe? What triggers a breath? Uh, basic airway adjuncts like LMAs, nasopharyngeals. I understand you guys know all about this, but we're going to talk about more of the functional comp components of that. And then using them, and when you should. And just because you have them doesn't mean you should. Subtle differences. Okay. There is an important distinction, and that is, Ventilation is not oxygenation, is not respiration, okay? Everybody, I think that, and I'm, I'm being recorded, so I've got to be a little bit sensitive about this, but one of the worst things that ever happened in medicine was the ABCs, because we know that that is absolutely wrong. We know that the ABCs, what we have all been taught since Peter Safar did it in 1953 or 54, or whatever, he kind of he coined this ABC. We know that's wrong. We know that people don't have airway problems. We know that people have ventilatory problems. Some way, sometimes, their airway is the issue. Most of the time, it ain't. People have to be adequately ventilated. And that, quite often, does not involve the airway. So, ventilation is the key. Sometimes, just because you're adequately ventilated, doesn't mean that you're oxygenating them correctly. And just because you're ventilating and oxygenating them correctly does not imply that they are adequately or that they have adequate respiration. Now, what is respiration? When I'm talking about respiration, I'm talking about using oxygen as the final electron receptor in the electron transport chain. We'll talk more about that in just a second. But this is very important. This is deadly important. When you are actually doing your job and you have somebody that's that's compromised in whatever way, whether they're sick or injured, and whether it's an adult or a kid, you have to, the first thing that you do is determine if they are adequately ventilated. And if they're not adequately ventilated, you ventilate them. That does not mean that they have to have an airway problem. All right, sorry, getting, getting all worked up. Okay, how breathing should work. How breathing should work. How breathing should work is there's an area just under, just in front of your brainstem, just in front of your cerebellum called the pons. Now in the pons, there's a bunch of chemoreceptors that are responsible, responsive to proton molecule, or protons, okay? They're responsive to protons. If you put a bunch of carbon dioxide in that area and it goes through the carbonic anhydrase and through the carbonic equation, whatever, you know, it saturates that pons with protons, and that's what triggers a breath. Is if the as the as the as the proton as the as the pH drops, which is the negative log of the concentration of protons, as the pH drops, your pons triggers more breaths. That's why you breathe more as you get more acidotic as CO2 increases. This implies that CO2 is the prime driver of your respiratory rate and volume. CO2 is the prime driver, not oxygen. CO2, and by proxy, proton concentration, or pH. And that all happens in the pons. So that's what controls it, is your pons. There are other things. There are also pH receptors in your carotid bodies and in the aortic arch. But the primary one is in the pons. <coughs> Anybody know the, uh, the uh, I think that that's Pucell's law in the bottom there. Okay, which means that for every reduction in the diameter of the breathing thing, it becomes four times more difficult to breathe. Okay, so if I were to make your airway smaller, it becomes much more difficult to breathe. Or if I were to make your airway longer, it also becomes more difficult to breathe. Flow depends on length and radius. For every change in radius, there's a fourfold increase in resistance. Yeah, that's Pucell's law. You can look up how to spell it later. But this becomes very important when we start talking about epiglottitis or peripharyngeal abscess or bronchopneumonia or asthma, for that matter. 
even though as you get farther down the airway, flow becomes less and less of a factor. When you get to the terminal bronchioles, air does not flow. Oxygen and CO2 diffuse. They do not flow. But in the major airways, flow is a factor. Clearly, it's easier to drink out of the big straw than the little straw. All right. Machinery. Okay, so that was airway. Now we're talking about how do you breathe? One of the most important things to understand is that your lungs don't suck. Okay? Your lungs don't suck. Your lungs do not ventilate. What happens is your lungs are stuck to the inside of your chest cavity and to your diaphragm. As your diaphragm contracts, does it go up or does it flatten and go down? It goes down and increases the volume in your... Goodness gracious. Make it stop. I feel like I'm in Disney World, you know, in the ride, in the line. Hold on, hold on. I think I know how to do this. There's got to be a volume in here somewhere. The bottom line is, as your diaphragm goes down, the volume inside your chest increases and the pressure drops. As a result of the pressure dropping, air gets sucked into your lungs. So, with a smaller airway, you have to generate more negative pressure to suck air down. If you drop the size of your trachea just a little bit, you have to generate four times as much force to pull the same volume of air through that hole. This becomes very important when you have somebody that's slightly hypoxic and they're generating more and more muscular contraction, but yet they're now, their muscular work is exceeding their oxygen capacity, their oxygen volume. This is why people get tired. It's because their muscular, their, their metabolic demands exceed the oxygen supply. And then you end up, so how do you fix that? You decrease their metabolic demands by providing positive pressure ventilation and decreasing that, uh, that muscle work. That's one of the ways that we help them. All right. You can see that the guy on the top has, inter, has scalene retractions or supraclavicular retractions, and then the kid on the bottom has intercostal retractions. Okay, you'll see this in kids by now, I'm sure. The diaphragm is the primary driver, but can, you also use intercostals. But you see how not only does the diaphragm flatten, but that the chest wall increases. All right. Intercostal muscles, again, pull up, and you see the pleural space. And if you violate that, remember that that is a potential space, and a lot of stuff can get in the middle of that, whether it's fluid or air or blood or pus. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that can get into the, into the potential space between the lung and the chest wall. And that becomes an issue. Is, is a tension, we'll, we'll talk about this more in a little bit, I, sus, I hope. Is a tension pneumothorax a ventilation problem or a perfusion problem? Trick question. I mean, clearly, I'm trying to mess with you. We're playing the guess what I'm thinking game. Any, any idea? What do you think? Yeah. Is a tension pneumothorax a perfusion problem or a ventilation problem? Is it, is it a B or is it a C? Kind of, but, but a pneumothorax... Is a, is a ventilation problem, right? A, a pneumothorax is a ventilation issue. A tension pneumothorax, on the other hand, is that a breathing problem or a circulation problem? Or is it an air, it's clearly an airway problem. It's a circulation problem. It, it's the, the problem with the tension pneumothorax is your intrathoracic pressure has actually exceeded the, the venous return to the heart. It impedes preload. It impedes cardiac output as a result. Tension pneumothorax is a circulatory perfusion problem, right? It's not a ventilator. And we also know, as we've already talked about, the fact that we've got ABC wrong. Just another example of how we got ABC backwards. A tension pneumothorax is an emergency. A pneumothorax is not a big emergency, okay? A pneumothorax, I've sent people home with pneumothoraxes, sometimes intentionally. Sometimes not. Okay. Pearl space. 
You can get a pneumothorax in there. A pneumothorax is not a bad thing. An insufficient ventilation is a bad thing. A tension pneumothorax is a circulatory problem. You drop the pressure, you, reduce, you restore preload, you're out of trouble. Creating negative pressure, we talked about that. The diaphragm flattens. The diaphragm flattens, it, it increases uh, intrathoracic volume, it decreases pressure, and you suck air through your mouth, right? How big does a hole have to be in your thoracic cavity before air preferentially goes through the hole instead of through your pie hole? Two thirds the diameter of your trachea. How big is your trachea? Have you seen a trachea yet? It's different on everybody, right? Yeah, it's about 1.75 centimeters or rough, below, it's less than two centimeters. So roughly a centimeter and a half. So a hole in your thorax or a hole in your chest wall has to be about a centimeter and a half before air will preferentially go through that hole instead of this way. That's a problem. That's a true ventilatory issue because you cannot adequately ventilate if you are sucking air this way because you need to suck it down into your lungs, right? All right, inhalation. Inhalation is active. Inhalation is active. You have to have muscular contraction to inhale. Do you have to have muscular contraction to exhale? No, it is passive. Your whole chest is set up to exhale. All you gotta do is not inhale when you exhale, right? When can this be a problem? Can you think of a situation where that would be an issue, where, where you couldn't exhale? Can you think of a pathological state where you could not effectively exhale? Asthma, COPD, uh, extrathoracic airway obstruction, intrathoracic airway obstruction for that matter, okay? Intrathoracic, so asthma, uh, COPD, these are all air trapping problems. One way valve on a endotracheal tube would be another one where you couldn't exhale. Okay, so you got a little ball of goo sitting on the end of the endotracheal tube. I've seen this before. You got a little ball of schmoo, right? A little inspissated junk. And as you push in a uh, breath, that ball of junk flies out of the way. But as air comes back to try to get out of the endotracheal tube, that thing slaps shut and causes a one-way valve. Endotracheal tube dysfunction, asthma, COPD, all exhalation inhibitors because exhalation is passive. You can't, you can forcibly exhale. Most people, of course, don't. Exhalation is passive. Okay, we talked about that. Turn. This thing, I'm telling you, it's like the most finicky thing. All right. Oxygenation. Now, we talked about ventilation. Now we're talking about oxygenation, and then we're going to still talk about respiration. Oxygenation depends on, oxygenation depends on Henry's law, which is basically that the concentration of a gas is proportional to the concentration of that gas dissolved in the fluid below it, right? So it turns out if you have a higher concentration of oxygen in the alveolar space than you do in the, in the vascular bed or on the hemoglobin molecule, oxygen is going to diffuse down that gradient, right? It's just gonna see a space that it can go into. Now the cool thing is most oxygen is not carried dissolved in blood. Some is. Most oxygen, the vast majority of it, is carried bound to the hemoglobin molecule found in the red blood cell. But the cool thing is oxygen diffuses from the alveoli, diffuses into the bloodstream and gets picked up by the hemoglobin molecule. Turns out you can carry a whole heck of a lot more oxygen on hemoglobin than you can carry dissolved in blood. It just works out better. It's just a more efficient system. Turns out it's, it's resulted in a heck of a lot more life than we care to think about anyway. Same way with CO2. CO2 sees a gradient, higher gradient in the blood, dissolved into the alveolar space. But let's say that you had an increased CO2 content in the alveolus. Would you be able to dump your CO2? No, again. This is what we talk about when we talk about ventilation. Okay, you got the, mechanic, you got the mechanics of ventilation, but this is the actual ventilation, the, the gas exchange the, that we talk about when we're talking about moving oxygen onto red blood cells and moving CO2 out of the red blood cell or out of the bloodstream and into the alveolus and then all the way out. Now keep in mind, air does not flow at this level. 
Air does not move. The molecules diffuse. And they diffuse up into that, you know, more larger airway where the gradients, so the, the, uh, the molecules continue to diffuse along that gradient. <sighs> Bloody hell. All right, respiration. Now we're starting to talk about respiration. Oxygen and CO2 will move along the pressure gradient, change the pressure gradient, and you change the amount of gas that can move according to Henry's law. And we talked about, on the left-hand panel, we're talking about how oxygen and CO2 dissolve into the alveoli through the, through the alveolar capillary. And there's another picture. Now, now we start talking about Again, this is the other side. This is in the capillary bed where you see oxygen dissolving. It dissociates because there's an, actually an oxygen dissociation curve, right? You've all seen that, right? The oxygen dissociation curve where if oxygen gets into a place where there is low oxygen tension, oxygen will dissociate from the hemoglobin molecule and move into that area. And you can change that oxygen dissociation. You can make it move off hemoglobin uh, more voraciously if you increase temperature, if you decrease pH, or if you administer like 2,3-DPG or some other chemicals, you can actually make oxygen jump off a of hemoglobin just a little bit faster. But the reason that the oxygen is jumping off the hemoglobin into the tissue is because of decreased pH, uh, increased temperature, et cetera. You know, just the, things, the kind of things that you would want oxygen to jump off. You know, if you've got a hot, acidic muscle, you know, like you're running, you want the oxygen to jump off. Now, what kinds of things can screw this up? If you don't have any freaking hemoglobin, that's a problem. It turns out that normal saline, lactated ringers, doesn't carry hemoglobin or doesn't carry oxygen. That's an issue. Nothing, nothing replaces blood except blood. We haven't come up with a good replacement for blood. So just keep in mind that when we, when we talk about cellular respiration, the ability to use oxygen where it needs to be used. You've got to have the little boxcars of hemoglobin molecules to move it from the lung to the muscle. And if you don't have the little boxcars and the oxygen doesn't get off the boxcars, then you can't have cellular respiration. So amount of oxygen delivered to the tissue is dependent on the amount of oxygen available from the lungs to get on the hemoglobin, the amount of functional hemoglobin, and adequate flow of blood or hemoglobin to the tissues. All right, now here we go. Now we're really talking about cellular respiration. What does oxygen do? Why do you need oxygen? And here's why. This is the part that a lot of people don't understand. All right, what is this molecule? Does anybody know? Glucose, it's glucose. If you take glucose and you split it in half and you stick it in the top of the Krebs cycle, you turn the crank several times and out the side comes eight molecules of ATP and a pyruvic acid molecule for each half molecule of glucose, right? You take that pyruvic molecule and a little bit of NADP and you drop it in the electron transport chain and then you crank it a bunch more time and like between 26 and 28 molecules of ATP comes out, I can't remember the exact number, okay? So one mo half a molecule goes in the top of the Krebs cycle, crank, 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 ATP comes out, pyruvic acid comes out in the bottom. You take that pyruvic acid and you drop it in the electron transport chain, crank, 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 out the bottom, out the side comes a whole bunch more ATP, and at the bottom come two electrons. You gotta do something with those electrons or your whole thing stops, right? What happens is oxygen comes along and picks up those two electrons and combines with carbon to form CO2. Oxygen is the garbage man. You don't live on oxygen. Oxygen is the garbage man that allows you to use glucose. Glucose comes out the, comes, goes in the top, electrons come out the bottom, oxygen picks up the electrons. If you, don't have elect if you don't have oxygen, what happens is the electron transport chain doesn't work. What about the Krebs cycle? Does it still work? Yeah, it does. But what comes out of the Krebs cycle? Pyruvic acid. Two, th two components, two components. Krebs cycle, electron transport chain. Glucose goes in the top, pyruvic acid comes out here, and, goes, and you drop that pyruvic acid into the electron transport tank. If you, if you don't have oxygen, the ETC doesn't work, and you have pyruvic acid. You had a hydroxyl, I think it's a hydroxyl ion, 
to that, or a, or a hydrogen ion, and you get lactic acid. That's where lactic acid comes from, is anoxic respiration. You don't have oxygen to pick up those last two electrons, and you end up with pyruvic acid being changed into lactic acid at the bottom of the Krebs cycle, okay? This is cellular respiration in its most basic crayon form. Glucose goes in the top. If you've got oxygen at the bottom, you get ATP and CO2 comes out and you breathe off the CO2. If you don't have oxygen, you get lactic acid. That's how it works. So you can still breathe. You can still keep, you can still keep your you know, cellular integrity intact if you don't have oxygen, at least for a little while, that, but that lactic acid is gonna build up and you end up gonna, your pH is gonna sink and then cellular mechanisms don't work very well anymore and then you die. So don't do that. Breathe, breathing is good. There is a difference between ventilation, oxygenation, and respiration. No glucose, what do you think happens if you don't have any glucose? You start burning fat, exactly. And this is a long chain fatty acid or a triglyceride, okay? You take the triglyceride, which can be any one of a number of long chain fatty acids, and you, you put it in your liver and a whole bunch of bad stuff happens and you come out with glucose. But you also end up with three forms of ketones, acetoacetic acid, uh, beta hydroxybutyrate, and acetone. And this is what, this is what you smell in somebody who is what? DKA. DKA. What's the problem with DKA? What is, the, what is the basic pathophysiologic issue associated with DKA? What can't they do? The, they can't get sugar into the cells because insulin is the key that sugar uses to get into the cell. Okay? If you can't get sugar into the cell, you're dependent on your long chain fatty acids and you start breathing off acetone. But you also, you also start sinking your pH, right? Because you're putting out a whole bunch of other things and you start developing the acetone and you start, as your pH goes down, what's gonna to happen to your respiratory rate? Yeah, your respiratory rate increases because you have to just increase your minute ventilation to keep up with your pH that it's sinking down. Okay. Again, this doesn't work. If cells are unable to find or utilize glucose, the body converts triglycerides and amino acids into ketones, into ketones and glucose. So, all right. Now that we know how, now that we know how you ventilate, oxygenate, and respirate, Let's see how many ways we can jack it up. All right, first thing, we can screw up your brain, okay? We can destroy your ability to, to breathe effectively. And how do you do that? Well, I can punch you in the head. Uh, this is what, has anybody, have you seen this yet? Guppy breathing? So does this person have an effective, uh, are they perfusing their head? No. They're not. I think they're probably, this patch implies that they are in like VTAC or something. So now I think that they've actually been shocked and now they're breathing effectively. See that? Not perfusing your head makes you breathe bad. If you break your neck, you can't breathe well. If I punch you in the head or shoot you in the head, you don't breathe well. I don't know what the problem is with that guy actually. And then this, this looks like a trauma, kind of. But chain stokes, what is chain stokes from? Head injury, apneustic breathing, and there's just a whole bunch. You, know, you never really get this. You never really say, oh my goodness, that is apneustic breathing. No, you just, you just detect the fact that they are not ventilating effectively. How else can we jack it up? Uh, you can make them super acidotic. And this is most consistent with what? DKA. This is what you see with DKA. And typically, the people that are in DKA are going to have two different chief complaints. 
One is going to be shortness of breath because they're going to say, I just can't catch my breath. The second thing they're going to complain about is nausea and vomiting, just persistent nausea and vomiting, especially kids. This kid, this kid is, has Kussmaul's respirations, which is super high minute ventilation. And you get that from ketones, uremia, sepsis, salicylate toxicity. Uh, I think that's methanol and aldehyde, lactic acidosis. All, you know, medical students and residents are just filled with mnemonics because they have to take tests. But acid, acidosis will increase your ventilatory drive to the point where you can no longer meet the metabolic demand of your increased, because it takes effort to breathe. All right. So, this is the, this is the formula that takes your, uh, so oxygen comes along, picks up that electron, those two electrons, combines with carbon to form CO2. CO2 combines with water through uh, carbonic anhydrase to form the, the uh, uh, carbonium ion, right? And the carbonium ion dissociates into protons and bicarbonate. Now, quite often what happens, you're like, well, if it's balanced, then your pH should be seven, right? It should be normal. Except what usually happens is you have an unaccounted for acid that chews up all your bicarbonate, or you have an unaccounted for base that chews up all your acid, or you have an overproduction of acid, an exogenous production of acid, or something happens that screws this up, okay? There's two ways to normalize this. One, is to breathe faster. You breathe faster, you breathe off the CO2. Because just think, if I, if I just gave you a big IV dose of vinegar and loaded you with protons, I'm gonna increase, because this goes both ways, right? This slides back and forth. If I loaded you with vinegar, your CO2 concentration goes up, you're gonna start to breathe more. Awesome. Your pH normalizes, everybody's happy, right? If I put a bag over your head, and your CO2 goes up, what happens to your pH? It starts to go up, or it actually goes down, because you become more acidotic, because the lactic acid starts to build up. It's an, it would be a respiratory-centric increase in lactic acid because you don't have oxygen, right? So that would make you a respiratory acidosis. You see where I'm going with this? Now, if you go up, if you go up in altitude, and there's not enough oxygen, and you have to breathe a lot, all of, a sudden, all of a sudden, there's not enough oxygen to meet your metabolic demand. You have to breathe more. You're breathing off more CO2 than you're breathing in oxygen. So all of a sudden, you've got a decrease in your CO2. Your oxygen is holding steady if you're at like 15,000 feet. Okay. So by breathing faster to meet my oxygen demand, I'm blowing off my CO2 just to keep my oxygen where I need it. As a result, you become a respiratory alkalosis. In order to normalize that, your kidneys have to start putting out more, more bicarb. This would be a metabolic compensation to a respiratory alkalosis. Let's just talk more about that. Let's, real quick, normal pH is between 7.35 and 7.45. pCO2 is between 38 and 42. These numbers are important. These two numbers are the most important. The rest of them are kind of figured. PO2 is between 75 and 100. Guys, I, you have to get into the, especially the ER patients, get into their chart. When you start looking at them, start looking at their laboratory results. If you don't understand a laboratory result in the ER, ask the attending. Ask the attending. Ask the attending. Ask the PA. Ask the attending. Ask the person that's taking care of that patient. Okay. Normal pH is between 735 and 745. Okay. Normal pH between 7.35 and 7.45. If it's less than 7.35, it's acidotic. If it's more than 7.45, it's alkalotic. There's two ways to become acidotic. One is if I don't breathe enough, okay? If I don't breathe enough, I have a respiratory acidosis. If I don't breathe enough, my CO2 goes up, okay? How can I do that? I can do that by shooting you in the head and then you don't breathe. I can do that by putting a Walmart bag on your, over your head and not breathing. 
I can do that by, I can do that by putting such a metabolic load on you because of your sepsis or your lack of hemoglobin that you no longer have enough oxygen delivery to meet your metabolic demands. Okay, that would be a metabolic acidosis or a decrease in CO2. So let's just stay with this. You're not breathing well enough. Your CO2 goes up, your pH is low, your CO2 uh, is going up because you're not breathing effectively. Like this would be the person, this would be the, uh, the narcotics overdose, the person with a respiratory rate of four or the person who just can't breathe well, a CHF -er, or a COPD -er, or something like this. Another way to become acidotic is your bicarb is low. How could you make your bicarb low? How would you make your bicarb low? Think about it. Their answers are right here. <laughs> Does anybody know what mud piles is? This is how you become a metabolic acidosis. Mud piles, write this down. Methanol, uremia, diabetic ketoacidosis, isoniazid, lactic acidosis, ethanol, and salicylates. Uh huh. Did you get that? Okay, good. See the film. <laughs> methanol, not ethanol. We drink ethanol. We do not drink methanol. Okay? Methanol is antifreeze, not isopropyl alcohol, not rubbing alcohol. Uremia is renal failure. D is diabetic ketoacidosis. P is paraldehyde, which is British Tylenol, I believe. Uh, isoniazid. Uh, or iron is another I, iron poisoning, lactic acidosis, ethanol toxicity, and salicylates or aspirin toxicity. Those are the big, now those are just the basic. There are lots of additional, there are lots of additional findings in mud piles. Look at tintinality. Open up tintinality and just, and just ask for mud piles or Google mud piles, that works too. Other things, diarrhea, why would diarrhea give you a metabolic acidosis because you poop out all your bicarb. Another way is drugs you, that you're like uh, other drugs that make you acidotic. There's a lot of different ones. There's tons of drugs that'll make you acidotic and renal tubular acidosis. This is an anion gap acidosis. This is mud piles is for an anion gap metabolic acidosis. That's if there's a difference between your positive ions and negative ions, sodium and potassium, chloride and CO2 greater than 13 milli equivalents, okay? RTA, would, and diarrhea for that matter, is a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. We'll talk about that later. Okay, alkalosis. Decreased CO2. How do you do that? By hyperventilating. Why do you hyperventilate? Because you're at 15,000 feet, okay? Hyperthyroidism, like thyroid storm, and hypoxia, which again can happen if you're just in an oxygen deprived environment or you're in an aircraft that just happened to decompress, depressurize at a certain period of time. And then metabolic, metabolic alkalosis, vomiting, you're vomiting. This would be like a, a two year old or a 18 month old with pyloric stenosis would have a metabolic alkalosis, a hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis at that. Volume depletion, like you're just like, I don't know, dehydration. Diuretics and steroids will also do it. Not typically, but they can. And then, okay, I'm just gonna put this down because it's infuriating, have it in my hand and not have it work. Okay. The kidneys or the lungs. That's what you're trying to decide when you look at an acid-based disorder. All right, how else can you screw it up? Upper airway problems. How? Because of the tongue. Now keep in mind, and I, you've got to do this. If you, see, if you see a sedation going on, absolutely get into that sedation. Because what you'll see is, once we sedate them, especially in big people. So like if, you've have, if you have an angulated deformity and we sedate them so that we can reduce that deformity, the thing that I want you to do the most is lift their jaw. Just lift it. You don't have to grab a hold of their teeth. You don't have to safety pin their tongue to their lip. Has anybody ever heard that story, right? No? Come on, man. Where, does it, where do you guys been? We used to carry safety pins inside our pee caps so that we could safety pin their tongue to their lip. So that they're, yeah, man, we did. So they, wouldn't, so they would open their airway. 
yeah, don't do that, it doesn't work. <laughs> it, was, it was totally crap, it didn't work. But what you do, what, all you gotta do is just put your fingers behind their jaw and lift it up. This is the airway problem. This is a problem that prevents you from breathing effectively. Just lift their jaw. You do not have to freaking start a lawnmower with their jaw. Just barely lift the angle of their mandible and they will go from to and it's amazing. It's the most fun thing because when you lift their jaw up, they take the most refreshing breath. It's like you're just giving them their life back, which you did. Okay, nasal pharyngeals are awesome. Oral pharyngeals are absolute crap. Okay, nose hoses are awesome. You guys have all had them now by now, right? Yeah, they're awesome. They're also turkey timers. If you're working with a drunk, you just stick that thing down their nose. When that thing pops out, they're ready to go home. Okay. Don't do this. Don't do the head tin chill, especially if, they, if you suspect that they're a trauma. Just lift their jaw. That's all you've got to do is lift their jaw. So it's clear their airway obstruction. In a 99%, I have never had to crack somebody. I've never had to, I've, I've seen countless gunshot wounds to the face, angioedema, peritonsillar abscesses, huge, you know, un uncompressible bleeding from post-tonsillectomy bleedings. I've never had to crack anybody, ever, for any reason. Why? Because you don't have to. You just have to make sure that they have an airway. All right, uh, other problems with your upper airway. I actually saw this. It wasn't a safety pin, it was a straight pin. But this, this is a safety pin hooked into their esophagus just down from their, uh, this is the epiglottis, okay? This is actually a kid, clearly, because of the shape and contour of their epiglottis. But they swallowed a, an open safety pin. Other things that will do that, uh, other things, so he's talking about strider and voice change. And, the, and you will notice, they'll be like, they will have an extra thoracic airway obstruction. They will have difficulty inhaling. They will not have difficulty exhaling. People with asthma and COPD have difficulty exhaling. People with foreign body extra thoracic airway obstruction have difficulty inhaling. That's how you tell, that's how you look at them, okay? Unconscious, so do not go sticking your fingers in this. I don't care who you are. Do not stick your fingers in somebody's throat. You will make it worse. I guarantee you. Just keep your damn fingers out of there. Just keep, sorry, keep your fingers out of there. All right. Henry Heimlich. <laughs> yeah. Everybody knows the Heimlich maneuver to try to address a upper extra thoracic foreign body airway obstruction. All right. What is this? What is this? Anybody know? What are we looking at? That's an epiglottis. Oops, is that a normal looking epiglottis? No, this is not something you should ever see. If you think that they've got epiglottitis and you're looking at it, you better be in an OR and not in somebody's freaking hut, okay? If they have epiglottitis, which is typically an extra thoracic airway obstruction, so they will have inspiratory strider, and they will typically be tripoding or leaning forward to try to open up their airway even more, okay? The last thing you wanna do is look in their airway. Take x-rays, you guys have a little speed zone, you guys, have you guys seen your little uh, uh, radar gun x-ray machines? Yeah, battalion, battalion level stuff. Um, but you can take an x-ray of their throat to see if they got a foreign body in there, to see if they got epiglottitis, whatever, but do not That's Strider. You'll see, you gotta, you gotta hear, make sure you try to hear, you should start seeing croup here within the next month or two. The croup season might not hit you, but it will definitely be here soon. If you, you've got to hear a kid with croup. Once you hear it, you will never forget it. And it's so easy to fix. All you gotta do is give them a little bit of humidified oxygen. Just, all you just gotta look is see, are you ventilating effectively? Don't do anything unless they have to have something done. Thank you, George. All right. Now we're starting to move our way down in, inside the thorax. Again, this would be 
that actually looks like more like a tumor. So this is vocal cords, and that's an, a tumor or a subglottic stenosis with croups, trachea, uh, tracheitis or tracheomalacia. Tracheomalacia is just a floppy trachea, so that as they breathe in, as they drop that pressure, it actually sucks your trachea shut. Okay, very bad if you're trying to inhale. Easy if you're trying to exhale. No big deal if you're trying to exhale. What do you do? Do you, do we carry racemic epi? No, we don't carry racemic epi. Neither do you. But you will carry normal cardiac epi that you can nebulize. It works. It's not the best, but it works. Three cc's and a little nebulizer gets you out of trouble, especially if it's in the middle of the night and you're on a train somewhere. Or, oh, there's your croup. And this is what croup does. The kid's asleep. That kid's not in trouble. Yeah, he's got some retractions. See that? It's not an inhalation strider. It's a very specific kind of cough. And you just nebulize a little epi and it's gone. It's just gone just like that. All right. Lower airway problems. Lower airway problems. Now we're talking about an inability to exhale. This is the difference between strider and wheezing. Okay? Strider is an extrathoracic inspiratory issue. Wheezing is an intrathoracic expiratory issue. How do you do that? How do you screw that up? You make this thick. You, you squeeze the, you make the tube smaller and you push the same amount of volume through it, which increases the velocity, exceeds Reynolds number or whatever, and makes it, vis makes it turbulent and it makes it wheezing. All right. See how, I, see how I just magically made that thicker? And then this guy. And uh, what you I'm getting a much this guy has a COPD exacerbation right here, and, he, and uh, what you should be able to tell, especially in these old guys, and you've really got to see them, is you walk in and you'll start to see them, they're air trapping. So although it looks like they've got uh, just tachypnea and respiratory distress, what they'll typically have is easily, they will easily inhale, but they will have, they will have a prolonged expiratory phase relative to their inspiratory phase. They may or may not have wheezing, but clearly this is an intrathoracic expiratory issue. As opposed to this kid, kind of the same thing, wheezing. That's actually kind of an extrathoracic wheeze. You know, that, that what you heard is a kid. You know, clearly that kid is not in any distress. That dude is clearly about ready to die. So that's bad. Don't do that. All right, another thing, failure of the bellows, okay, or an inability to effectively use the mechanics of ventilation. In this situation, you've got a parasite, which is impeding your ability to breathe, or you have eaten too many parasites, and it impairs, just imagine, just imagine, in both situations, if you are in a supine position, your diaphragm now must exert an exceptional amount of force to increase that intrathoracic volume, okay? You actually increase the, the force by which your diaphragm has to contract, and that will lead to less and less effective ventilation until the point where you start to accumulate CO2. Your brain will get used to increasing CO2 until finally your CO2 continues to climb and then you become oxygen dependent. Your brain, your pons, switches mechanisms. It's no longer as responsive to CO2 as it is to oxygen, and you start to become oxygen dependent. And this is what happens to both sets to a certain degree, clearly to this guy. This guy's ability to ventilate effectively has been compromised. So has this guy. What do you think, what can you possibly, what might have caused this? There's a thousand explanations. Botulism, uh, just protein dehydration, sepsis would do it. I mean, there's a countless number of things that would impair an infant's ability to produce ATP to fire their diaphragm and effectively ventilate. Uh, or an inability to use the mechanisms. Again, so this is a hole. That's bad. From the committee on TC3. Yay, committee on TC3. 
Okay, big hole, very bad, don't do that. How do you fix that? Is that just done, you're just gonna die? No, now you just have to switch. They can no longer generate the negative pressure, so what do you do? You provide positive pressure. You just overcome their inability to use the mechanism. Just another reason for them to have their compromised ventilation. This is a really cool thing. So this is a dude, right? And this is his nipples, and this is his sternum. And it's not together. Get in on those heart cases. Dr. Zolfagiri and Dr. Steinberg are both more than happy to have you in their heart cases. And you put in chest tubes, you'll get two, two chest tubes per heart case. Okay? And it's pretty easy because you just poke it through their chest and look at it on the inside. And you're like, yep, there it is. And then what is this? Needle D, needle D. I just love this needle D thing that you guys come up with. Uh, one thing about needle D compressions, use big needles. Use big needles. Don't use 14s, especially the inch and three quarters that we have. Use 10s and 12s and always go lateral and high. If you put it where the buttstock hits you, you're probably right. And go down. This is too medial. This is too low. Put it where the buttstock would hit you, okay? If you're in an upright position, not if you're in the prone, okay? What's wrong with this guy? What happened to him? It's a seat belt. What would happen with a seat belt? It, crush, it breaks all your ribs. And now you're no longer to effectively inhale. Remember, do these, does any of these people have a problem exhaling? No, they cannot inhale. So now you have to inhale them. All right, loss of lung expansion again. So this is the CAT scan. Remember, in a CAT scan, they're always laying on their back. You're always staying at their feet. This is a what? This is a CAT scan. What level are we at? Anybody know? Yeah, they were in the thoracic cavity. What is this big white thing? Heart. So what is, what is this? Lung. What is that? This is bad stuff, right? It's not supposed to be there. Could be fluid, could be cancer, could be a lot of others. Could be, could be pus for all we know. We don't know. All right. Pleural effusion, cancer, diaphragmatic hernia, etc. I can't tell from one slice what that might be. Could be a loculated pleural effusion, most likely. Okay. How else can we jack it up? So we talked about an inability to inhale, an inability to exhale, an uh, impediment to the mechanics of ventilation. We can also jack it up by depriving you of oxygen, by putting you in a oxygen deprived atmosphere or by screwing this up some way. We can screw this up by giving you pneumonia and filling your bronchi and filling your alveolus. We can screw this up by giving you a PE and not allowing blood to go through. One of which is a VQ mismatch. The other one is a shunt, but we'll talk about those in a minute. All right, consider the following. Okay. As you move from low atmosphere, from low pressure to high pressure, what happens to gas? Does it expand or contract? Hmm? It expands according to which law? Boyle's law, excellent. All right, next one. What does Dalton's law say? The volume, the concentration of a gas is proportional to the concentration of the gas dissolved in the liquid, right? Which is how you oxygenate your hemoglobin. And then the last one, of course, is Henry's law, which is, if I'm not mistaken, I think I got, these, I got these mixed up. Henry's law is the one concentration of the, in the gas phase is proportional to the concentration in the liquid phase. And Dalton's law is the percentage of the gas is, is equal to the partial pressure. It's the partial pressure law. How, what, what, is the, what is the percentage of, of air that is oxygen? 21%. What is atmospheric pressure measured in millimeters of mercury? 760 millimeters of mercury. So how many millimeters of mercury is, is oxygen responsible for? What is the pressure of oxygen at sea level? 21% of 760. That's Dalton's law. So 21% of 760 is 150. 
That's the partial pressure of oxygen. However, if you go into the, into the exterior atmosphere, where the partial pressure is only 480, then you've only got this much oxygen, which is why you get hypoxic when you go up in altitude, because there's less oxygen. If you were to fart, it just doesn't smell as bad when you get up at altitude. OK, how can you screw this up? Number one, you can fill the alveolus with funk. OK, you can fill it with, you can, you can do it through pneumonia. Now, pneumonia is a complicated mechanism because it not only destroys, not only does it fill the alveolus, it also destroys the barrier or the, the interface between the type uh, one alveolar cell and the endothelial membrane, endothelial cell of the capillary, which are this fused thing that gas diffuses freely across, right? How do you screw that up? By making it thick, by putting in a bunch of bacterial infection and cytokines and making it all swell up and increasing the distance through which the gas must diffuse. You can also fill this thing up and just, you just, just totally jacked it up with pneumonia. How else can you do that? You can not only infect it, remember infection is just a fancy word for irritation, but you can also inflame it with like chlorine gas, you know, chlorine gas combined with water to form hydrochloric acid and just burns your lungs. What's ARDS? Yeah, acute or adult respiratory distress syndrome, but what is it? Does anybody know? It's an increase in the distance between that type one alveolar cell and the capillary endothelial cell. It, you fill that potential space with fluid. Now, in ARDS, this is a low, low pressure issue. For some reason, you just fill it up. You can do that from heroin overdoses. You can do that from drug things. It's, there's a whole bunch of different mechanisms that can cause ARDS, which is just you fill that space between those two cells with fluid. Another way to fill that space with fluid is by increasing the pressure in the pulmonary capillary. How might you do that? Yes, yes, I agree. By increasing the back pressure from the left atria. And how do you do that? By increasing the back pressure in the left ventricle. So the left ventricle is already packed, right? Blood is trying to get from the left atria into the left ventricle, but the left ventricle is already full. So the pressure backs up into the left atria. Where does the pressure build up after the left atria? Back into the pulmonary arteries. All of a sudden the pulmonary artery, or the pulmonary capillary, becomes like one of them soaker hoses, right? And the pulmonary capillary starts to exude fluid into the potential space between the alveolar type one cell and the endothelial capillary cell. And it fills up with fluid just like an ARDS, but this is a high pressure pulmonary edema, which is, the pathophysiologic, pathophysiologic mechanism behind what? CHF. That's how CHF causes hypoxia. It's a diffusion limitation. Okay, this is bad. This is like a destruction, and that is very bad. Okay, <laughs> radiation pneumonitis, drug-induced amiodarone, especially causes the destruction of the uh, interstitial interstitium of the lung. ARDS, again, we talked about acute respiratory distress syndrome where you have an increase or you start to mess this up by doing this. You see how this becomes inflamed and you get all kinds of stuff. It increases the diffusion distance for the gases. So not only can CO2 not get out, but oxygen can't get in. And, and as a result, your lungs are less compliant so it, it actually it requires more muscular contraction. It requires more ATP, it requires more oxygen to get the same amount of oxygen. And before long, your metabolic demands exceed your oxygen supply, and then you stop breathing, and then you die. And that's how you die. Inflammation. Superman never performed CPR again. I thought that was great. I thought that John did a great job with that one. But, all right. Pneumonia. How does pneumonia hurt you? Pneumonia, pneumonia and ARDS have several similarities, but this is how we think it works, okay? It's never, it's never quite that easy. If it were just that easy, we'd like hang them upside down and just squeeze them a lot and get all the pus out, if that was that easy. It's never, never quite that easy. 
How do we fix it? We give them antibiotics. Do antibiotics make it go away? No. Antibiotics just get it under control so that your body can take over from there. Antibiotics don't make it go away. They just get it under control. It's like a help. It's like a crutch. Ooh, that's bad. Don't do that. That would suck. Bye. See ya. Okay. What is that? <laughs> what is this? What did he just walk out of? Yeah, he just walked out of a chamber. Right. What's this? Yeah, it's World War I. What was the primary agent in World War I? Mustard. Mustard, which was also, which is a part of chlorine gas. And the way chlorine gas works is it, it combines with water in your, in your mucous membranes to form hydrochloric acid, and then it causes a chemical burn. That's what it does. Okay. What does it do? It, in, it just causes an inflammatory reaction that increases the diffusion, increases, you know, funk production <laughs> that impedes your ability to ventilate, oxygenate. How do you get over it? You give them, you increase the partial pressure of oxygen and force oxygen down the gradient. You just make the gradient so big by providing exogenous oxygen, you, you make that gradient so big that you just force oxygen into the, onto the hemoglobin. You also, you also BiPAP and CPAP, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, BiPAP and CPAP, how do you think that that might help? After everything we've talked about so far, one of the biggest things is your oxygen demand exceeds your ability, your muscular ability to get oxygen. The way CPAP and BiPAP, one of the mechanisms of how it works is that it reduces the muscular requirements, muscular exertion necessary to ventilate effectively. It's not the only mechanism, but it's one of them. And then intubation. The cool thing about intubation is that you paralyze it. You can paralyze them. And now they have no more metabolic demand from, from ventilation. All right, a PE, pulmonary embolism. Happens a lot more than we used to think, but that's simply because of our ability to detect it, not because the actual incidence has increased, but anyway. All right, the problem here is that you have an increase in dead space, which is you are ventilating, but you are not perfusing. Increase in dead space. You are ventilating, but not perfusing. Uh, this is different than a shunt. A shunt is you are perfusing, but not ventilating. A shunt is, and the way to tell the difference is, if you give oxygen to a shunt, the ox your sat doesn't go up. But if you give oxygen to a VQ mismatch, it does go up, okay? So you can give oxygen to these and it will increase. How do you detect it? They typically will complain of chest pain and shortness of breath or just chest pain or just nothing or just I'm short of breath. They really don't have a very specific way of presenting. Uh, VQ mismatch created when an area of the lung is ventilated but not perfused. PE creates a shunt that cannot be overcome with additional PE with additional oxygen. Hmm. So they're saying that a shunt, a, sh a shunt does not improve with oxygen. That's correct. A shunt does not improve with oxygen. A shunt just a shunt does not improve with oxygen. VQ mismatch can improve with oxygen. Risk factors for a PE: history of a PE, uh, which includes any of the hypercoagulable states like immobilization, pregnancy, estrogen use, cancer, smoking. How do they present chest pain? Chest pain and tachycardia is really all you're usually gonna get. You might pick up the fact that they're a female smoker on birth control pills. That's the dead giveaway. And then that's how, then we, now we're gonna start to talk about how we're gonna fix it. Now we're gonna talk about how to fix it. Number one, if they're ventilating and oxygenating well, do not jack with it. It's fine. It's just one less thing you got to worry about. Do not make work for yourself. You've got enough work already. Don't make a bad situation worse by, by putting some intervention in, okay, that you don't have the capacity to manage, even if it's just something, you know, you want to go take a, you want to go drink coffee. Don't make something that you have to 
manage all the time. Don't make a bad situation worse by doing some intervention. And use the right tool for the job. You, and make sure you have all your tools available when you start your job. All right, suctioning. Uh, a couple things about suctioning. You can easily run into a situation where two wall suctions are insufficient. I've run into that before, where somebody's vomiting or bleeding or something, and their, their whole oropharynx is just a fountain, and there's no way that they can breathe through that, and two suctions at the same time are not enough. Suctioning is terribly important, often overlooked, and also dangerous, especially in kids. Do not suction them prolong for a prolonged period or you will they will get bradycardic especially kids especially kids how fast is this guy's heart rate anybody know huh no how many people have heard the 300 151 75 60 50 don't don't do that 300 151 75 60 50 that's it that's it don't ever do anything else so if the next QRS complex was here, it'd be 300. 300, 151, 75, 60, 50. Okay. Tracking. If you want to, everybody talks about, you know, measuring stuff, just suck it. If you, if you see stuff in there that needs to be sucked out, just suck it. Use wall suction if you can. The little suction things like this, they do work, they suck. The older they are, the more suctioning they can tolerate, okay? But do not, do not dally in here. Suctioning is dangerous. It will stimulate them to vomit. Uh, it will make a kid bradycardic. Suctioning is bad. If you see something that needs to be removed, use suction. That's what it's for. If Don't just use suction for fun, especially in little kids. <laughs> don't use it for fun, yeah. All right, BBM. If there was one thing I could do to somebody, it would teach them how to use a bag. Everything can be used, everything can be done with a bag. Okay, you can, you can make BiPAP, you can make CPAP, you can do everything with a bag that you need to. Bagging is great, bagging is hard. Bagging is dead hard. Okay, the ability to form a seal and bag, the seal takes two of my hands. I've been doing it for a couple of years, it takes two hands as hard as I can get, and I can only do it for a, maybe a minute or two before my hands get too tired to actually hold that mask on, which means I've got to have somebody else squeeze the bag. It takes three hands to effectively bag. Now, if you have somebody in respiratory distress, and I've done this on countless occasions, you can actually bag them up if you bag with them. If you splint their respirations like BiPAP, you can actually set their uh, you can actually increase their expiratory positive pressure and you can actually increase, you can, de you can unload their inspiratory effort by bagging them and then give them a little bit of resistance to blow out again and you just created BiPAP with a bag. Bagging is essential. Bagging is very difficult. You can add adjuncts to bagging, but don't add an adjunct if you're getting away with it. All right, this is BiPAP. This is actually CPAP, okay? CPAP is, it's a constant pressure. CPAP is a constant pressure. CPAP sucks because it's, all it's doing is increasing the pressure that I need to blow out, okay? It will get you, it will buy you some things in some situations, like CHF, it's pretty good because that increased intrathoracic pressure decreases preload and actually increases the efficiency of my left ventricle by decreasing preload by increasing my intrathoracic pressure. Tracking? CPAP works that way. It can also kind of squeeze, increase your alveolar pressure, theoretically you could, and, and squeeze your capillary uh, veins and, and, and squeeze out some of that pleural effusion Theoretically, I don't think that that's really the, a valid. It could be. I'm sure Terry Coulter tomorrow will be able to provide you a little bit more information about that. BiPAP is the cat's meow, man. BiPAP is awesome because it provides increased force. It unloads your muscular contractility. It helps you breathe in addition to providing that expiratory resistance 
that decreases your preload, that makes it easier for you to breathe. BiPAP is awesome. BiPAP is awesome. We use it all the time. I would put BiPAP on every ambulance. You guys should use BiPAP. The Save 2 ventilator can do BiPAP. You can do it. It takes a trick, but you can do it. Okay. Normal breathing, CPAP, BiPAP. Get in there and see every person that's on BiPAP. See how it's set up. Make sure that you can do it on your own. For us, we're working on, you can, if you hook a BVM, if you use this mask, we can use this mask, it's on our CPAP uh, kit, and you take the, the uh, accordion hose with a 22 millimeter adapter and attach it to the BVM, you can make BiPAP. You don't have to just hook it up to the CPAP. You can make BiPAP. You have to have a little adapter about this big. You just hook it up to the BVM and you breathe with them. You gotta watch them, but you can breathe them. You can make BiPAP. <sighs> Things you have to be able to do to do BiPAP. The person has to be awake. I had a, we used to have the full face mask for BiPAP. And I saw that I put this old guy on BiPAP one time, walked back in, I walked out, walked back into the room and he's looking at me over the top of his puke. <laughs> very bad, very bad. Okay, it doesn't work if they're not able to follow commands. It doesn't work if they're in obvious respiratory distress. It doesn't work if they're breathing more than 25 breaths a minute. Okay, it doesn't work if their pulse ox is super crappy, super crappy. If they need to just go on a vent, BiPAP has improved patients, but it has not reduced the number of people who get intubated. That's a very, very important finding. CPAP, I think, does improve patients clinically. However, it has not resulted in a reduction in the number of patients who get intubated. It's an important, important distinction. Uh, if they have an altered mental status, if you can't fit a mask on their face because they got a big beard, if they're hypotensive, why couldn't you use this if they were hypotensive? Because that increased intrathoracic pressure and decreases preload, decreases cardiac output. If they're already hypotensive, I just, de I just made them more hypotensive. And you'll see that. You'll see people that are slightly hypertensive get put on BiPAP, and you'll see about a 20 to 30 hit point hit on their pressure. And then recent GI surgery because you'll pop their guts, which really sucks. All right, advanced airway stuff. Uh, okay. RSI versus drug-assisted stuff, if hemodynamically unstable, consider resuscitation before you intubate them. I intubate people so that I can go drink coffee. I'm not kidding you. I intubate people so that I can go do something else. Okay? That's why you intubate people. You don't intubate people because that's the way that you effectively ventilate them. No. I can effectively ventilate them without intubating them. I intubate people so that I can move on to something else. Okay, I innovate people so I can put them on a vent and I can go drink coffee or shop on Amazon. Okay? If I need to effectively ventilate them, I bag them or I use an LMA or I put them on BiPAP. Okay? When you get ready to innovate somebody, make sure you are prepared for the worst possible situation because that's the problem that you're going to run into. You're going you're gonna to get in there, you're going to paralyze them, you're going to sedate them, and then you're not going to be able to innovate them because something terrible has happened. I mean, this is, it's the, the pre-mission checks, pre-jumps, checks, whatever you want to call it. But you've got, you've got to have all of the stuff ready for a catastrophe to occur. Suction, 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 bright lights, lots of hands, lots of people to go get you stuff. Okay, make sure you've got it all there. Make sure that you're ready for any possible uh, complication. Crike stuff, big needles. You know, the same big needle, the same 10 gauge that you use for a needle for a needle decompression is the same needle that I would use for a, a, a needle, thor needle tracheostomy. Uh, paralysis, if you paralyze them, you must be able to ventilate them. And then post indentation, uh, placement and confirmation is entitled CO2 waveform, not color changers. And then post intubation sedation, you must keep them sedated. You must keep them sedated, if not paralyzed, or both. Actually, both. You can't, you can't intubate somebody and not sedate them. <laughs> or, you know, someone will do it to you someday. All right. This is 
what it should look like. These are the vocal cords, and that's a tube going through there, right? This should never be seen ever in the history of medicine. You should never use this thing. It is horrible. Don't ever do it, okay? It's the bulb, right? You squeeze the bulb, you put it on the tube, you let go of the bulb. If it's in the esophagus, the bulb doesn't inflate. If it is in the esophagus, the bulb does inflate. Don't ever use that, okay? You can use it to like squirt your buddies with water, whatever you want to do, but don't use it for this, okay? Okay. This sucks, but it's not useless. It might work. I hate them. The, 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 the emergency department staff will use them simply to see my reaction because I, want, I typically will throw them out of the room, okay? If they ever want to see the flight characteristics of an intel CO2 color changer, they just give me one of these. They suck, but they're not useless. This is the way of the game. You have to have this. An intel CO2 waveform. You can do it on the Tempest, you can do it on the Life Pack 12s, you can do it on the Life Pack 15s. You have to turn the line to intel CO2 and you have to have the adapter. The adapters can be occluded by fluid and blood and snot and whatever, but it is a continuous verification of the appropriate placement of the tube in addition to their metabolic um, uh, status. Like if they're coding, we know that entitled CO2 is the most sensitive indicator of a return of spontaneous circulation. I don't use pulses anymore. I use entitled CO2 from my, from my endotracheal tube, or LMA. LMA, I think, is the equivalent in this situation. Waveform end tidal CO2 is essential, and there is no replacement for it. And you can do it on Tempest, you can do it on a life pack, it doesn't matter. You've got to have it. Not only that, but it is the proof that you will give to your theater surgeon that shows that you had the tube in the right place. It is and that when you handed it off to the PJ, they were the one that lost the tube, not you. <laughs> That's a, that was a dig right there. Okay, you listen to breath sounds and that's great, but typically it doesn't mean a thing. Okay, you can have it in the goose and you can hear perfectly good breath sounds a lot. End title CO2 is the name of the game. Connect the patient to the vent, learn how to use a save too. It's one of the best pieces of kit I've seen in a long time. Set the mode to volume control, which you don't have the option of doing in, uh, in the save two. It's all based off of height, which is great because you can set the height up and down to just meet your minute ventilation. You look at your end tidal CO2 and you look at your oxygen saturation and you just start varying your minute ventilation to get yourself in the windows. Set the tidal volume to six to eight milliliters per kilogram per minute of ideal body weight based on height, which the save two does for you and then set PEEP to at least five millimeters. You can't do that with a save two. Uh, you could do it if you rigged something with a BVM, but, uh, but you want at least five millimeters. If they're hypotensive, you can turn that down, but you typically won't. I, sir, I, or doc, I, I think it does have a PEEP setting on it. Does it have a PEEP setting? I can't remember. It's a far right button on there. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Learn something new every day. It's just, I haven't seen one for a long, I haven't seen one for a couple of months, so at least five. Because otherwise, you actually end up having to have a higher uh, pressure initially to get yourself blown up. You ha you actually, your compliance is low if you allow the lungs to completely deflate. So you want to have a little bit of positive pressure because it increases your compliance. It makes them easier to ventilate. Okay, problems. Normal is negative pressure in ventilation. You are creating a negative intrathoracic pressure. You suck blood into your thoracic cavity. You load your heart by breathing. Every time you take in a breath, you pull blood into your thoracic cavity. You load that right side of your heart. By putting, yourself on, by putting a patient on positive pressure ventilation, you increase intrathoracic pressure, you decrease passive venous return, you decrease preload, you decrease cardiac output. In addition, you can do a whole bunch of other really bad stuff, especially if the person has any difficulty exhaling. If the person has any difficulty exhaling, like COPD or like uh, asthma, all of a sudden you can auto peep. These people, remember, exhalation is passive. This person can actually develop increased, increased trapped air until finally, 
you're having difficulty getting in a normal breath volume of six to eight milliliters per kilogram because they've already got stuff in there. They haven't, they haven't gotten rid of the breath that they just took. And now you can't stuff another one in there. Now all kinds of bad things start happening. Your intrathoracic pressure goes way up. Your preload goes way down. Your blood pressure starts to drop. You can pop a lung. You can do all kinds of really bad, bad things. So uh, in negative pressure, blood return, positive pressure, not so much blood return. This is a functional MRI. Okay, what is that with a right and left carotid artery? What is that? It's the aorta, which means what is this? Left ventricle. And what's this? This is the right atria, left atria, diaphragm, lungs. Okay. I love functional MRIs of hearts. You get to see so much good stuff. You want to know what, you want to know what hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy really looks like? Go find a functional MRI of it. They're on YouTube. It's awesome. Okay. Uh, mechanical ventilation will harm your patient if you are not careful. Uh, so if the, the, the way that I typically explain it to people is if you have a patient on a ventilator, so they're intubated and on a ventilator. If you start running into trouble, like your SATs are down, your pressure's down, you can divide your problems into two groups. It's either the ventilator or the patient. If you get rid of the ventilator, you just got rid of half your problems, okay? Now you've got tube and patient. If you're still in trouble, get rid of the tube. You still got rid of most, half of your problem again. If you still have problems, now you've got patient problems, patient-related ventilatory problems. So this is either an a auto peep, like an asthma kid who is hyperinflated, in which case you decompress him. So imagine this. This patient is unable to exhale. What would you do to them? You exhale them. You do a chest compression, and they, they, you exhale them. Okay. What is another possible explanation for you being unable to effectively ventilate a previously ventilated person. One is auto peep. What's another one? A pneumo, a tension pneumo. So what are the possible issues associated with mechanical ventilation? One, you've dislodged the tube. Two, you have an obstruction of the tube. Three, you have a pneumothorax or four, equipment. It's in the wrong order, but it's a good way to remember it. The way I remember it is, if I get rid of the vent, that's one problem I don't have to worry about. If I get rid of the tube, that's another problem I don't have to get rid about. Now I've only got, really got two problems left, right? A pneumo or auto peep. There's no auto peep in here. Okay, I guess obstruction would be one. But, but the, again, this is only dealing with the ventilatory issues of the patient. Bag them. That's the end of that one.